Good evening. <laughs> We're like Fraser News presenters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the credits rolling. Um, good evening and welcome to the launch of Blue Ticket. I'm here at um, Burlington Books with Sophie McIntosh. Hello. Um, yeah, um, welcome. Uh, you're joining us in the uh, the secondhand nether corner, at the back of the shop. It's not. <laughs> it's an unusual um, spot for us to be doing events, and this is a a new venture for us. So please do bear with us. Um, yeah, so I think we're just going to kick straight off uh, with a reading from Sophie, um, and then we'll give a little introduction. Uh, to, to the book, uh, and we'll, we'll um, have a conversation, uh, and then please do throughout just um, place any questions you have in the, in the comments, and we'll, we'll either deal with them as they come up, or um, we'll uh, take some questions at the end. Um, so, take it away, Sophie. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I'm going to read a bit from the beginning of Blue Ticket. I'm just going to read, yeah, a short reading. It began with the allocating of luck our bodies pinballs inside a machine. It was the year of overlapping adolescences when the girls started to faint and grow tall. When I went to see my doctor at the clinic, the part of the wall where she measured our heights was dotted everywhere, as if with the eggs of flies. Mine was lost in there with the rest of them. Straighter, straighter, she said. Rap my knuckles with a ruler. Look up, what do you see? Just the dust gathering or the wallpaper of your ceiling, doctor, I didn't say. She made notes on my body. I nibbled at the edges of my own skin. She wrapped sheets of gauze around my raw thumbs. Stop chewing on yourself, she said, and wrote down something which might have been failure to nurture. My father bought a wiry grey dog when I turned 11 for my heart. Run faster, I shouted at him when he couldn't keep up with me. This was love. Cool light, spiders erupting from their silver webs inside my window frame. Out there somewhere was destiny. The dog and I were running towards it together. I liked to bury my face into his peppery fur, though I think I was allergic. It is possible that love was making me sick all along. Drink a lot of milk if you want to speed it up, the knowing girls told us in the bathroom between classes as we massaged balm into our chapped lips. It hadn't happened to them yet, but they had been able to find things out. Eat fats and oils, they said. We switched all the taps on and then we left for our lessons. At dinner, I took a spoonful of butter and ate it neatly. My father watched me and didn't say anything. I took another, licked the spoon. Be careful in your wanting, was a slogan written on the wall of the clinic. I must have read it 500 times over the course of that one year alone, my legs swinging back and forth on the orange plastic chair of the waiting room. Girls left one by one throughout the term. No goodbye parties, no notes. By the time it was my turn, barely anybody remained. It was me and two other girls and the boys my age in the classroom pushing our pencils across paper as we multiplied and subtracted and memorized underneath the sun's passage. I felt no great fidelity to the concept of free will. At 14, I had been awaiting the future for months. I sat for hours on the yellow tiles of my father's bathroom with my knees drawn up to my chest, as if I could compel my body onward with the force of my thoughts. I couldn't rejoice in anything, except that each event brought me nearer to adulthood the clear and shining horizon of it. It was as if we had to swim through mud to get there, a necessary barrier to us reaching the ocean. Get through this, I wrote on the back of my school notebook. Private mantra. I felt very advanced to have made such peace with myself. I knew nothing, obviously. All this I spoke about with Dr. J, a harry pale woman, owner of the marked wall. Our growing brains were stored on tapes in her filing cabinet, which held a psychic onslaught of numberless teenage girls waiting to be sifted. What is your mind doing lately? She used to ask me, and I would say the same thing every time, which was, it's not doing anything at all, which was often also the truth. I slept deeply and walked in the forest with my father's gun after school, looking for the shivering bodies of rabbits, though I never fired it when I was alone. I became sentimental about pine cones and poetry and swam my prescribed laps at the leisure centre with the other girls my age, 
walking home along the grey country road bordered with greenery. As the year drew on, long red marks welted my thighs mysteriously. Skin stretching, the doctor said, you'll be tall. At the time, I didn't believe her. On slow days, I prayed for my bleed to come. Prayed to nature to make it happen, to the wet grass and the sky. My mother's locker waited for me in my father's sock drawer. It wasn't locked away, but it was empty. My mother was buried in the grey cemetery outside of town. The ticket might have been buried with her. I didn't ask. My father took me to a restaurant. It was my first time playing at adulthood, and I didn't do a good job at it. Cracked hollow bread rolls. I ate three of them very quickly. I saw the sad mushrooms in the carbonara of snails and then could not eat those. Tender heart, my father called me then. He was a little angry. We had wine and I drank a splash big enough to coat the glass, but no more. It made my tongue feel lively. My father showed me how to swirl the wine around and what the tide marks told you. Like reading tea leaves, he said. I have looked into the wine and seen the future. It lives at the bottom of the bottle. When all the wine was gone, he lifted up the empty bottle and held it to his eye like a telescope. See, he laughed, but I did not ask what the future held. She would have wanted you to pick a blue ticket, he said to me as he waited for the bill, but he did not elaborate. I did not want to seem stupid and to ask, so instead I nodded. It was only trying to fall asleep later on that I realised what he had been telling me about my mother. He was young to be a father. At the weekends, his friends came round to the house and drank beer and watched me. They played cards, but not games that I recognised. One, two, one, two, they chanted as they threw the cards down. Another beer. I lay on my stomach in the dark in the hall where they could not see me. I wanted to watch and not be watched. It was fundamental to my desire. You do not understand that at 14, but I can understand it now. In the cinema, later in the year, my fingertips slid around inside a bucket of popcorn. A boy sat next to me. I felt him put his hand out to me as if he was swimming. The hand moved up and down in the air until it reached my body. Hand found my, sh hand found my shoulder, my chest. I let it rest there peacefully. The film ended, the hand lifted. The boy left before I could look. At school, the girls' bathroom was almost always empty by then. Nobody left the taps running. One day, the grey dog became fat and even slower. It turned out she was a girl. She lay down and small blind things came out of her, pink and bleating like hearts. My father did something with them, set them into the wilderness or gave them new homes. I chose to believe this. It was the dog I thought about years later when I looked down at my stomach and there it was, undeniable. I too would be slow. I too would lie down upon the ground, cold ground, blue morning. You should have touched them, said the last girl at school apart from me. You would have been their mother. They would recognise your scent and your scent only. A sad streak of water girl with a nerving pale eyes. I didn't like to think I was her sort, but here I was. Here we were. She placed a sandwich carefully inside her mouth. In my room at home, I sniffed at my armpits just to see. It seemed unidentifiable. It seemed like anyone else's stink. Nothing that anything would call home. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. That was great. Um, yeah, and I, I think I guess my first question, which is kind of by way of introduction to the book, uh, follows on from the reading, and um, yeah, I suppose follows on from the previous book. And wondering how the two connect, and was to ask about the lottery because the water cure was in the same way as the blue ticket, um, kind of about restrictions placed on women's bodies um and yeah so in the in in um in blue ticket we follow Kala as she um as she reaches puberty and she is, she goes through the lottery whereby a kind of reproductive liberty is decided mm -hmm. um and i wondered where the grain of that idea came from and whether that was where the book started from or whether that came later <laughs> Yeah, no, it's interesting because I think um, with both of them, you can kind of 
you can kind of love them you're like oh like women's issues and it's like almost feels slightly reductive but because both of them are just kind of things that you know I just as a woman <laughs> I have yeah. experienced and have thought about in my life like kind of um you know things I'm interested in because they are kind of the fabric part of the fabric of our life I guess like things mm-hmm. like violence and patriarchy but also you know the easy answer I guess was I was getting a bit older and thinking about babies a lot and that's kind of where blue ticket came into play yeah um thinking not so much about kind of you know reproductive liberties but obviously that is a concern but thinking more in terms of the stories we tell ourselves about um what we deserve and about kind of societal ideas around motherhood and Mm -hmm. you know what it means to be a good mother um what to do you know in a world where there is like this we have I think more than ever before the choice to not be a mother or to be a mother and there's lots of really good reasons not to have a baby <laughs> I mean especially in the time of COVID <laughs> and, cl- and climate change and stuff um so to think I guess about these questions of agency and desire but mm. in that context yeah I think yeah desire was the word that was on my lips as well because mm. I feel like the, the book is so good about that um and it seems to be largely about how that's misunderstood mm. by kind of mechanisms of patriarchal control and yeah I um, think definitely in both books like desire is a massive theme really sort of those things when you, you kind of don't realize until you look back on them both together and you're like oh like in both of them desire is like kind of a very productive force but also a very destructive force and I guess I like writing desire not as we're used to seeing it necessarily mm-hmm. with women like I just it, you know it's kind of it's like ugly but also very um very catalyzing i guess mm-hmm. in both of the books yeah but i, I guess also that the, the book kind of really finds the beauty in that spicy darkiness as well mm-hmm. it, yeah and really yeah it's one of the really moving aspects about the book i think um yeah i, I suppose another uh, another link between the two books which i was thinking about as i was reading it was um how it looks at solidarity between women in the face of um these mechanisms again of control and and how um those the, the kind of various forms of oppression um obstruct and problematize um the relationships between women mm. um and I, I suppose that that's something that it's difficult to talk about because you know it's a launch we don't want to ruin the book <laughs> <No spoilers>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so you can tell our road runner legs trying to find a way of framing the question without ruining the book but um yeah i suppose the relationship between um, Kala and Marisol is really central to especially the, the latter part of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I, I wondered how that relationship came about in, when you were writing it and how you thought about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think like in the society of Blue Ticket, um, so much of the kind of policing is self-policing, but also policing by other people, I think. And like, you know, it's kind of um, mm-hmm. this weird environment where like, the women are kind of your worst enemy in competition but then there are parts of the novel when they are like your most comfort and yeah I think like sisterhood and supportive friends and kind of finding your own like platonic family is really important and something mm-hmm. I always like to explore in my work but also I think I think there's an aspect of this in the as well like there is that kind of um aspect of women can harm other women a lot and I don't want to be presenting this kind of idealized version of like oh like women are amazing and we'll never harm another woman especially in blue ticket you know like they're kind of often they're competitors and they've been told their whole life that they're competitors and that mm. they are kind of pitted against each other and it's just interesting in the sense of you know being like a woman so we're growing up as a teenage girl and you kind of have that that kind of still that vibe of you know there's like friendship is really important but there's always an edge of like something maybe I don't know, I just, mm-hmm. I, I really like the comple- I guess the big complexity of these relationships and how there is like so much love, but there also can be that harm as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's true of, I mean, reading it's a man. <laughs> as a teenager, I think that's true of male-related friendships as well. I think that kind of edge yeah. is part of friendship. And I think that one of the things I really enjoyed about reading the book was how it doesn't shy away from from that, but really explores like how the edge can kind of, yeah. I just think love in general is just kind of mm-hmm. just any kind of yeah any kind of intimate relationship. I just think I'm just really interested in getting to the nitty gritty and mm-hmm. being like, wow, there's like so much good stuff here, but there's also so much terrifying, dangerous stuff here, and what yeah. happens like when the stakes are kind of higher. Yeah, 
another one other question that kind of leads, leads me on to is you were talking about um, how uh, people are policed by one another in the book and in, in a more formal way um, Calla is policed by Dr A mm. um, her psychotherapist and I thought that the way that the book uses psychotherapy and the kind of again like the I suppose the, the goals of psychotherapy and subverts those was really terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, actually, was like, I didn't want the book to come across as like anti medical or like specifically anti therapy um, or anything, but it, it, just, it was just, you know, taking something that we kind of recognise from our world that is meant to be a force for good and then using mm. it in a way that is kind of, you know, like kind of twisting that language of wellness and yeah. twisting this idea of kind of interrogation to be really negative. It was, yeah, it was just, some of it was kind of just quite fun to have <laughs> to create a figure who is kind of very all-knowing and like malevolent in this way but also who you're kind of dependent upon yeah and 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 i don't know i, I guess she almost she tries to develop a friendship with him mm. um in the way that she has a friendship with Mansell, but obviously it's a it's a one directional mm. relationship and the, the, the ground that she runs up against i think is really fascinating and terrifying mm. no, like, i don't think she, the book is so much, so much power over her so it's like yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I think yeah, really, you've really shown how how easily the ground can shift mm. under under your feet when those kind of like, like, when that language is used to a different end, um, which is yeah, which is really terrifying. <laughs> so use that word again. Um, and another thing I wanted to ask you about was it, it, it's kind of a road novel as well, um, which I, I, I thought was really fun while I was reading it. Um, when Kala again. Without spoiling it, when Cal moves around between the various <laughs> stages of uh, through the various stages of the story, um, yeah, and I, I thought that that was, I, I felt like you were having a lot of fun with that in the writing, and I wondered whether there was any kind of like road books that had come out of, or yeah, I think one of the ones that was a big one for me was Under the Skin by Michael Faber. Have you have you mm, read it? I actually have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, like someone kind of driving around the Scottish Highlands, and uh, I don't know. I don't know how much I can spoil this either, so like, yeah. maybe they're not completely human. Um, mm -hmm. But. <laughs> 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 so, uh, sorry, sorry, cats sorry. out of the bag then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, I've never read it. Um, uh, but I mean, it's beautiful. Anyway, um, so I think that idea of kind of a really uncanny landscape and. Um, I mean, because it's in the Highlands as well, which is, you know, it's kind of, it's very, it's, it's kind of at once familiar and also very remote. And um, yeah, so kind of that idea of driving around and being in this like very mountainous place it's quite bleak but it's like unfamiliar but it's still familiar at the same time yeah. and it's like it's, it's almost like you don't know how dangerous it actually is like it can feel really dangerous but actually is it okay like it's just the highlands yeah <laughs> but it's not just the highlands and blue ticket we don't know where it is no exactly yeah, that, <laughs> I, I, that was another one of my questions because it, it, that, that the the landscape is really kind of recognizable but not identifiable mm -hmm. And I like that, that. <laughs> <Sorry>. yeah, <laughs> like recognisable but not identifiable. Exactly. It's very and it, that felt very deliberate. And I I wondered how how you went about building that because I think you've done it like really successfully, but I think that's a real that's a difficult trick, right? Like it's very easy. We we know where we are, but we don't know where we are. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. like when I I just had a really specific set of kind of I guess markers in my head for what I was trying to achieve. So I was kind of thinking about. The highlands but also about like switzerland and kind of swiss lakes and forests and kind of like beautiful little towns on the banks of like lakes in switzerland mm. and also like taking holidays with my parents in like um, france or germany in the 90s and like being at service stations all the time and I had a really good holiday in iceland a few years ago where again there's like a lot of service stations and a lot of holiday in iceland a few years ago where again there's like a lot of service stations and a lot of kind of bleak landscape and it was that kind of that kind of idea of transit and roads surrounded by like beautiful landscape um just something about it just really stuck in my head and it felt like a really good setting um for what she was doing that kind yeah. of bleakness but there's also like a way into the bleakness if that makes sense yeah yeah i guess i guess because it's yeah it allows the interiority to kind of become the, the landscape almost mm. yeah in a way that doesn't you don't second you don't look twice in in, in, in a sense no, I, really, I really like service stations and hotels and stuff and i'm not gonna say liminal space because like crystal crystal love it i really that idea of kind of you're never really at home um you're always on the way to somewhere else and it's always kind of like a little promise of 
um, some kind of fun or something better, like, you know, you're going to get a snack or you're going to have a good night's sleep or, you know, I, I, I kind of really was drawn to the idea in the context of something a bit more dramatic and to life or death. Yeah, mm. up the stakes a bit of a, yeah. of a hotel. You're not going to like get a Yorkie bar and a pack of crisps and like <laughs> use the bathroom. You're going to be like on the run. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's perhaps hotel visits for 2020. It's, a, yeah. <laughs> it's like a guidebook. Um, do, do you think we should have another reading? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes, but should, I, should I carry on from where I was? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll do the lottery station. Yeah. yeah. That sounds good. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to read uh, from the lottery station where Cala picked her ticket, which um, defines her as a blue ticket. One day, finally, there was a red slick in my underwear. In the shower, I washed my body with care, unfamiliar blood spooling thinly down my legs. A clot of dark jelly fell out of me. I felt, cal I felt calmly that perhaps I would die. Instead, I put on the dress that had been hanging on my bedroom door for the past year. Pink satin, sprigged with white flowers at the hem and neckline, a petticoat underneath that scratched at my knees. It smelled of the damp, of the accumulated uh, sweetness of the cheap perfume that I sprayed beautifully on my body every day. I went and twirled in front of my father, who fetched the locket and gave it to me. Don't put it on yet, he said. We got a taxi because it was a special occasion, although it was a long way. We had a hulking shape of the nearest town, back out into the outskirts, past wooden houses like ours. The taxi driver had a plastic ice cream box with foil-wrapped ch chocolate hearts. Take two, he insisted, and put the box back under his seat. A pretty girl, he said to my father, who said, watch it smiling but not smiling, and then the two of them were silent for the rest of the journey. The heart contained dark cherries. I folded both pieces of foil into one speck and pushed it into the gap between my seat and the door. The lottery station was a lot like the clinic, two stories of pale brick, a flat roof. When we pulled up, the emissary outside was smoking a cigarette, but he threw it into the ground when he saw us. Congratulations, he said to me. He led us inside to where the others waited us. The floorboards were wooden, varnished aggressively. Countless feet had scuffed the floor. It pooled the reflections of all the lights. Spotlights from the ceiling. A lamp on the desk where a man in a dark suit sat on an orange plastic chair, watching us, legs crossed. He could have been a doctor, but he wore no white coat, no white plastic gloves. There were four other girls in their own dresses sitting on a row on a wooden bench. Flowers both real and fake pinned chests. They were not the girls from my school. One wore velvet, two wore tulle, and the others wore satin like me. I took a shine to the girl in satin. We lined up, waiting to pull our tickets from the machine, the way you would take your number at the butcher's counter. The music popular that year played from speakers on the ceiling. Just gravity enough. Just ceremony enough. Not necessarily such an important thing after all. My name was called first. They watched me as I walked the length of the room towards the machine inside its cloaked box. I put my hand in it. I was apprehensive but ready for my life to be decided. I closed my eyes and thought about my father with the wine bottle to his eye. The machine was silent as it discharged a sliver of hard paper into my hand. It was a deep cobalt. Congratulations, the possible doctor in the dark suit said to me. The other girls followed, each taking their own ticket from the machine in turn. Almost a full house, he exclaimed at the end, reading a piece of paper spat out from the machine. We huddled and compared tickets. They were all blue, except for me, which was white, oh, except for one, which was white. The girl with the white ticket was escorted into a separate room by the doctor and another emissary. We watched the three of them walk through an unlit doorway. When the doctor came back, he clapped his hands twice. You have been spared, he said, with a terrible benevolence. At the desk, the emissary who had been on the door wrote down the results to communicate to home, the clinic, the places distant and important that we did not know about. One by one, we were called into another room, a different room to the girl who had pulled the white ticket. I lay on a reclining bed with a crisp paper cover, and another doctor, this one a woman, and comforting, almost, in the familiar white coat, told me to fold up my knees. She pushed something inside me that hurt, a sharp and spidering pain. What is it? I asked, and she said, your doctor will explain it all when you go to wherever you're going. She said when and not if, and I was grateful for that. Behind me, I left a large rose of blood on the paper. 
The bathroom of the lottery house is filled with yellow lights, the veins of my thin neck standing out underneath it. I was a plucked chicken with badly applied eyeshadow, but the locker was around my throat now. There was a long, low mirror above the sink, a wicker chair in the corner, and two bathroom stalls painted peach. In the mirror, I watched the other girls leaning against the wall, toes flexing, eyes raised to the ceiling, moving to the door when the girl with the white ticket came in to join us, then back to the ceiling. There was a dying flyer arrangement in the corner of the sink, gaps of oasis showing through pinched carnations. The music came through in here too, speakers in the ceiling or underneath the sink. At first I kept looking at the girl who had drawn the white ticket, the other girl in satin, though hers was pale blue and dirty at the hem where it dragged. Her eyes were red. I had the urge to take her by the arm and run with her somewhere out to the woodland where I used to smoke with the other girls in my class between lessons, beyond the broken barbed wire of the school perimeter where the teachers could not see us. But I did not touch her. I made myself stop looking. Inside the cubicle, I spent some time reading the names and dates scratched on the door. With the safety pin that held on my fake peony corsage, I engraved Kala, blue ticket, a smiley face, and the date underneath. The swell of relief, smooth and natural as a muscle, I would never have children, and I was glad. I had been a child myself not so long ago. I did not want to put any other puny creature through that. I went with the rest of the girls back to the lottery room, where our parents stood lined up. There was a table with pots of tea and coffee, biscuits and thin sandwiches on china plates, packets of tissue. The doctor who had supervised the whole thing stood in front of the parents as if we had interrupted them mid-address. Maybe we had. The mother smiled. The father's looked grim. An emissary handed us each a bottle of water, a compass and a sandwich from the table wrapped in a napkin. We did not get to pick the filling. The bottle given to the white ticket girl was larger than ours, I noticed, and she received two sandwiches. It was happening immediately, the diverging of our paths, no time to spare. Go, the doctor said to us, to the place of your choice. Walk into it, anywhere but here. Congratulations. I met my father's gaze. I had a city in mind. He looked back to me and nodded his head. We walked out together into the cool night. The adults stayed in the lights for coffee and refreshments to debrief with the doctor. We might see our parents again, but we might not. Some of the girls halted at once when we got outside. They didn't know where to go, new and bewildered as the forms I saw at the edge of the trees and the dusk. The girl with the white ticket, though, she walked directly into the woods, the lights of our torches bouncing off the satin until she was gone into the dark. We were not so different. Um, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of things I wanted to ask off the back of that reading, which is so that just describing the lottery and mm -hmm. then the, the subsequent departure from um, from Callis home. Um, I wanted to ask about trauma because I think a lot of the book is built around the things that you don't describe because mm. the journey from Callis home to the city is the kind of central. Mm. Um, yeah, I wondered how you made that decision. Um, why you like what not to tell? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what not to tell? Yeah. Um, I think it's kind of almost scarier what we can imagine like I like to leave that kind of that degree of ambiguity where we can fill in our own our own picture I guess mm -hmm. and because the journey is kind of it's a literal journey but I think for readers it will feel kind of metaphorical you know it's like the journey in, the journey into adulthood <laughs> yeah. um so that journey can be filled with like you know so many horrors imaginable or unimaginable um or not even horrors like less than horrors but you know it's just it's not all going to be easy on that journey and I think as well, like in the water career, I'm always really interested about what what can we kind of rush in when we leave a gap. Like what what are the things that we will we will do? It's like it's a kind of makes it a more personal experience for the reader, I guess. But maybe maybe that's a cop out. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. But I, I think it's kind of it's a parallel journey that, that kind of makes like in the book that is described, but it kind of gives the fact that the the first journey isn't described gives a undercurrent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was really. Um, and another, another thing I wanted to ask, ask you about was, was ritual, because what you described there was kind of ritual, and I think 
rituals are really central, obviously, to the, to the water cure. But there's an element of that carried over, I think, into this book in the way that they can be kind of oppressive, but they can also be, um, you know, productive and subversive. Um, yeah, and I wondered if you see any relationship between your two books and about how they use ritual. Yeah, definitely. I think, I don't know, there's so many experiences which are very nebulous. And mm. in, in life and in everything and so to be able to kind of ritualize those things like adolescence like the choice of whether to have children or not um you know ritualize things like like you know the experience of masculinity or toxic masculinity or how we experience pain how we deal with those things to actually turn those from like nebulous things which don't have an answer which we have to grapple with in the kind of really unending terrible way and to just kind of reduce them almost to like a really firm concrete thing and to be like mm -hmm. you know you, you pick a ticket and it decides um you do this therapy and it cures you like so kind of ritualizing those things is interesting for me in a way because i think it's kind of partly like a wish for <laughs> um but it's also an interesting way to think like you know what if we could kind of just give a action or a concrete kind of resolution to those things what if we could just you know cast them out of them uh, out of us by performing them in mm -hmm. some way i think that's yeah. what just draws me back and back yeah well i think it really kind of like shows the seductive nature of that simplicity or that possible mm -hmm. simplicity but also how that's kind of um i suppose how how a state to take advantage of that mm -hmm. um yeah and also in the way that dr a uses his relationship and his power mm -hmm. like the power of of naming yeah. or pathologizing. So you, you don't want the things that happen in the water cure or blue ticket to happen, but there is like in a way a sort of comfort in that kind of sim simplifying, <laughs> oversimplifying but um and the kind of yeah, the everything kind of being just quantifiable instead of being like, oh I'm feeling this this feeling and I don't know what to do with it. To be like, no, it's fine, you feel you feel this and you do this and it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it never is okay. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, <laughs> I, I feel like there are certainly characters in the book for, you know, it's, it's a kind of, it's degrees. Mm -hmm. For some characters, there's, they're, they, they fully embrace that comfort of, you know, the freedom to not have to choose. <laughs> um, or if your desire, you can at least pretend yourself with it, it aligns with your desire. Mm -hmm. Then you can have a certain kind of fulfillment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. like, Cal is, like, very happy. I mean, no spoilers. No spoilers. Cal is very happy mm -hmm. until the point where she's not. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. how much of that is... It, if you've just been told something your whole life and you've kind of internalized a lot of ideas and you you know you then they haven't all come externally you've had these ideas about yourself as well and you have we have an image of who we are and it, it, there is a kind of comfort in that image and you know it's, it's not it's not kind of all, all bad like there, there is yeah. a lot of happiness that she gets i think that was really important to me in the book as well and that's why it's hard to kind of you know it's, it's one of the things it's like a dystopia is a dystopia for some people but some people it's utopia but you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not like it's all bad for her. She's not kind of having an awful time all the time. It was just one, this one fundamental thing, which is kind of very off limits to her. And then it turns out that that is the thing that she wants. For yeah. Reason, so. Yeah. I think, yeah, that talking about dystopia leads me on to another from ritual to genre. <laughs> <laughs> one, one word questions. I think it's interesting. <laughs> how, <laughs> this is, yeah, because I think we were talking a little bit before about how, you know, uh, people's expectations about what a book might be mm -hmm. might lead their reading. And I think genre can have, play a role in that. Um, and dystopia has certain, I don't know, associations or like expectations attached to it. Mm -hmm. And do you think, how do you, how do you kind of think about that when you're, when you're writing? Because I, I feel like they're not, they're not dystopias because, you know, they're books about living with complexity, right? Mm -hmm. And that a uh, kind of uh, straightforward um, dystopia is to, is much more kind of a Nietzsche and it's like there's good and there's bad and I feel like your books kind of play in that space that mm -hmm. liminal space <laughs> the liminal space <laughs> <laughs> like a service station <laughs> <laughs> yeah in between so I mean how I mean do you, do, you, do you feel like that's something that you have to think about when you're writing the book when you when you wrote this and you wrote, when you wrote the water cure like that expectation the reader might have or and how you might yeah, it's something I find like kind of limiting because I never really go into a book thinking that I'm writing any specific thing. It's like you're writing a book, and that's something that I like love about fiction is that you you know you're you're making things up so you can kind of do what you want. You can do the world exactly how you want it. You can pick and borrow things, and I think it's like I think it's fun to be borrowing things from genre mm -hmm. and to 
without kind of have, having to kind of adhere to every trope so that, but then you obviously like I said you have the kind of the problem of expectation and managing people's expectations and I think just some of it's unavoidable because I guess yeah like we have ideas of what a dystopian book is and mm-hmm. those ideas have come over like many years and there's lots of you know, there's a big kind of um a subset of books um but it can just kind of it can, obviously can feel limiting because in a book like Blue Ticket, which you can kind of say is a dystopia, but also it's like I'm trying to manage people's expectations. It's like there's no world building. Like, sorry, there's like, there's like zero answers. You get <laughs> um, a car and you move through it. There's, there's, <laughs> like, there's, people are smoking and there's no technology. And it's like I said, it's like a cross between the Highlands, Switzerland, and a service station in Germany in 1995. And so, like, you know, <laughs> there's the magic mixture. But, like, why? <laughs> like, I, 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 it's kind of, it's not really all thought out in the Tim's. As it so bizarre, so I kind of, you know, I, I guess if you have to kind of put a label on it, I think of it more as literary with speculative elements. But um, mm. I, yeah, it's 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 a hard one because I don't want people to feel like let down or somehow missold. If you know, if you go in and you're like, oh, I really wanted to read a reproductive dystopia, which is kind of like the Handmaid's Tale, and you know, it's got swashbuckling and it's got fully like fleshed out, like you know, it's all about, um, yeah, it's all about kind of. Uh, reproductive agency and so it's like super fleshed out and there's like a massive backstory and stuff it's like well you're not going to kind of get that there it's more about you know grappling with questions of the self how pretentious that sounds <laughs> but you know like self and goodness and desire in again the 1995 kind of gym <laughs> <laughs> um so it's kind of how do you manage those expectations really you kind of you can't and i think as well on the other hand you have people who maybe would maybe really like the book, but who might be like, oh, I don't really want to read a dystopian book because I only read, well, I'm, I'm more tend more towards like literary fiction and stuff. And, yeah, it's just, it's all kind of a mess. <laughs> it's not a mess, we yeah. can't even just, re- reading books is a mess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess it's, it's, it's yeah. It's As fine. readers, like, how do we kind of separate our own ideas of like what is, w- what we like to read and what is kind of literature and what is books? It's just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a snob as such as anyone else, but you know, I kind of, I have an idea of what, what books I do like to read and, yeah so yeah i mean i feel like i need to be tricked into reading things that i don't think i would like sometimes so i think it's a game isn't it always um it's not like no genre no covers every, every book is just in a white a white kind of jacket. yeah you just do it like <laughs> we do it in france in exactly the, uh, but... yeah there are rules i think i, I I'm, I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to pretend <laughs> i know what they are <laughs> but i think it's quite limited about what you can do so that yeah you can't judge a book by its cover oh, wow. um yeah but I hope he does it by cover, because look how beautiful it's It is a beautiful cover, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we've got a question. I think maybe we should, rather oh, yeah. than me asking my one-word questions, we should see if anyone's got more. So the location of Blue Ticket feels so atmospheric. Did you have particular places in mind? Oh, well, OK. <laughs> yeah, some quite specific ones. Um, yeah, so yeah, I was kind of thinking in terms of yeah, Switzerland um, and Highlands and also kind of, um, yeah, service stations and those, those are like the three main ones for me, kind of um, road holidays and kind of bleak mountainous landscapes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and obviously lots of hotels. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think if you got, haven't got any more questions um, in, the, in the comments, we should just raise a glass yeah. to Blue Ticket. Oh, yeah. thank, you. thank you for three really... of you watched this. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> and if you're watching afterwards, because this will be available on YouTube afterwards, um, you can't ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to you buy just the have to, like, bloody book. Recite them to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, find out. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.